Chapter 13 of Between the Larchwoods and the Weir. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jennifer Painter. Between the Larchwoods and the Weir by Flora Clickman. Chapter 13 The Old Wood House. The Old Wood House stands on the lee side of a belt of trees, part of the squirrel's highway, as we call it, that runs down one side of the flower patch, sheltering it from the bleak north winds. Picture to yourself a building rather smaller than a very small church, built of great blocks of grey stone, with walls nearly two feet thick in places, a red-tiled pointed roof, a door at one end, and in case the walls should prove too flimsy to stand the winter gales, huge stone buttresses prop it up on the off-side, i.e. the side where the ground goes on running downhill, lest the structure should take it into its head to run downhill too. In place of a spire above the door, a weathercock swings its arrow to the winds. At least, it would swing it on any well-conducted apex but being merely mine, it permanently points south. Not that it is particular where it points. All it asks is to be left in peace, to close its eyes in meditative contemplation of the landscape. We occasionally get a ladder and then a long stick and move it round, trying to urge it to deeds of daring do, but it falls asleep the moment our ministrations cease. The last time... It was a neighbouring farmer who climbed the ladder to reason with it, after I had assured him there was no penalty under the defence of the Realm Act for regulating weathercocks. He was a bit reluctant to touch it at first, as he said, what with clocks not being allowed to tick as they pleased, and the time being jiggered with anyhow, you didn't know where you was with nothing. But once I had taken full responsibility for the affair, he went up with right good will, and, forgetting that it was the arrow alone that needed to move, he gave a sturdy tug to the north, south, east and west arrangement, and sent the arms of that in all directions. Then when we wanted to fix it up again, a question arose, which was the north? A local light supposed to know everything, who chanced to be passing, was summoned for consultation. After carefully surveying the various corners of heaven, as though looking for enemy aircraft, he said he didn't know as he could say exactly which were in the north, unless he had summat to tell him. We all felt like that too. But if we would afloat a needle on the top of a basin of water, then either the point of the needle, or, let's see, maybe it was the high, he wasn't quite certain which, would point to the north for sure. Well, all hands rushed for basins and needles, as you may suppose, because, whether it was the point or the eye didn't matter much, since we knew the direction in which the north lay, all we wanted was the precise angle. But alas, every needle promptly sank to the bottom of the basin, without so much as a kick. Eventually we refixed the north pole approximately, pending such time as the head of affairs should arrive when we knew we could rely on the small compass at the end of his watch-chain. But Virginia, who uses the weathercock more than most of us, as she sees it from her bedroom window, and says it is so useful to dress by, was lugubriously certain his watch would be stolen on the next journey down, and begged me to place the arrow, still asleep, pointing south. Even an approximate south, she said, might at least help to keep her spirits up, when a north-easter was blowing. And south it remaineth unto this day, despite all our blandishments, and probably will do so till the end of the war, when the retirement of the food controller, who, presumably, supervises weathercocks, may permit of our using a modicum of grease. The old wood house, which, by the way, was originally used for coals, though no trace of this is left upon its clean, lime-washed interior, is the first building you run across as you enter by the top gate, which is the widest entrance we possessed. 
Here you step from the lane right into a tiny larch plantation, and the path to the cottage is arched over with the boughs of the trees, while the brown cones crunch under your boots, or roll away down the steep incline of the path when your foot touches them. It was among these trees that a small clearing was made in the distant past to accommodate this particular outbuilding, though why the coal house was considered the most artistic bit of bric-a-brac to greet you as you enter the main gate is not clear. The actual outline of the building is not remarkable, being merely four walls and a pointed roof with a door and a window, but at least it looks simple, dignified and solid and what it lacks in architectural decoration has been supplied by nature herself. When we first saw it, we called it the private chapel, but later on I found Abigail and co. calling it the picture palace. At any rate, there it stands, shadowed by great oaks seemingly immovable, with their gnarled, wide-stretching arms spread as in blessing over the lowlier woodland things. A big Spanish chestnut, though tardy in coming into leaf, scatters worthless burrs around later on, with generous good will. A walnut tree invites the passer-by to rub its aromatic leaves. And is there any treasure trove quite like the walnuts that one finds in the long wet grass on a windy autumn morning? Larches and firs make shady colonnades, with their straight uprising shafts and dark drooping branches. Silver birches, always graceful, no matter how they may have had to twist their trunks to accommodate themselves to their environment, give lightness and vivacity to the whole. Incense there is in abundance. The warm, resinous odour of the larches is always abroad. Mountain ash trees load the air with scent in the late spring and are ablaze with crimson in August. Two or three lichen-covered, twisted old apple trees hang out bunches of pale green mistletoe for all to see during the winter months, and then surprise one with a bride-like flush of white and pink in the spring. Where the sun is brightest, a big hawthorn carpets the ground with white petals in May. Then there are the lovely limes, and the lime tree is much more of a stately lady than is realised by those who only know the sad, maimed and distorted stumps that disfigure suburban gardens in London. But see this lime tree that forms a link in the squirrel's highway. Its trunk measures about ten feet round. Under the shadow of its drooping, far-sweeping branches, you could give a small Sunday school treat. Though the lowest branches spring from the trunk at least nine feet from the ground, their far ends touch the grass, forming a complete tent of translucent green and gold as you look upwards through a multitude of layers of leaves to a sun you cannot see but which seems to have turned the whole tree into a rippling mass of molten colour and when it shakes out its bunches of scented yellow blossoms and trails them by the thousand down each branch and stem then indeed the lime tree is a lovely lady and the bees and the butterflies come from far and near to pay her homage. And each tree has a special and distinct winter beauty of its own in the outline of branches and stems and twigs, a beauty that is lost to us once the leaves appear, but which suggests an exquisite etching in winter when the dark lines are silhouetted against the sky. The most graceful is the birch, with its light tracery of fine filaments often with tassel-like catkins dangling at the end. The oak and beech give the impression of enormous strength in the ease with which they fling out their massive arms with seldom any tendency to droop. And each tree has its special and distinct melody when the wind signals the forest orchestra. There is the sea surge of the beeches, the swish of the heavily plumed firs, the rain sound of the twinkling aspen, the soft whisper of the birches, the aeolian hum of the pines, and the sibilant rustle of the dead leaves still clinging to the winter oak. Outside the woodhouse door there is a little clearing adjoining the grove of trees 
where a perfect thicket of wild flowers smiles at you for the greater part of the year. First come the early violets clustering about the roots of the trees and in the shelter of the grey rock fragments, while primroses dot the grass with their crinkly leaves and then send up pink stems covered with silver sheen and delicately scented flowers, each as big as a penny. Ox slips grow on the bank that borders one side of the clearing. Later, it is an expanse of moon daisies, thousands of them swaying the whole day long to the motion of the wind, like the ever-restless surface of the sea. And with the moon daisies are buttercups, crimson clover, rosy purple knapweed, spikes of pink orchis delicately penciled with mauve all trying to grow to the height of the big yellow-eyed daisies, while here and there ruddy spears of sorrel outtop them all. Tall grasses of every kind are here, some like a fine translucent veil of purple, others grey or a pinky green, some shaking out yellow or heliotrope stamens, some ever trembling like the quaking grass, but all mingling with the tall flowers, softening the surface of the mass of white blossoms that seem in the sunshine almost too dazzling to look upon, were it not for the mist of the grasses that envelops them. Underneath the tall flowers there is a wonderful carpet of lesser growing things, masses of trefoil, the yellow blossoms often touched with fiery orange, patches of heath bed straw with its myriads of tiny gleaming white flowers cling to any spot where the grasses leave it room to breathe. Its first cousin, the woodruff, preferring a shadier part of the bank at the side, the bank where the wild strawberries grow to a luscious size, and whortleberry bushes add a touch of wildness to the spot. The smaller clovers, both yellow and white, seem to thrive under the bigger flowers, where most else would suffocate. Pink-tipped daisies bloom wherever they can find room to hold up a little face. Rosy pink vetches wander about at pleasure and pretend they are going to do great things when they start to climb the stems of the moon daisies. Where the big fir trees throw a shadow and the sun only touches the grass when it is getting round to the west, foxgloves send up shafts of colour and the pale blue spiked veronica carpets the ground. Still further back, where the sunshine never penetrates, even here something strives to give beauty to barrenness and soften austerity, for the small-leaved ivy starts to climb the hard tree trunks, undoubtedly one of the most beautiful of the many living things that are neighbour to the old woodhouse. And always in the grass there lie the snapped-off twigs and branches of the larches, with their brown picots up stems that are studded with exquisite cones. We strive hard to better nature, to make new designs, to evolve fresh beauty, but with all our skill and experiments we have yet to improve on the cone as a design, with its rhythmic reiteration of the one small motif and the perfection of its proportions. In my mind it ranks with the smoked silver seed ball of the dandelion, both of them examples of absolute beauty derived from the simplest of outlines. The walls of the woodhouse have their share of green. On the north side an ivy, with a gnarled main stem, the size of a fair-sized tree trunk, sends evergreen branches over roof as well as walls. Outside the door, which opens to the south, stone crop has planted itself in masses among the stones, a perfect carpet of it that in June is a bright yellow. In the good old times, before my day, the stone crop served as a convenient spot on which to dump the coal sacks. On the western side, where the ground drops down, a warm, snug and sheltered bank, in the long grass, white violets bloom by the thousand in the early spring, their sweet little blossoms streaked with mauve, nestling up to the old grey walls with the trustfulness of little children. Add to this long-fronded ferns growing out from among the wall stones, and you have an idea of the geography of the place. On a hot day, the cool shade on the north side 
is an ideal resting place. On a chilly day, the south side gives you a shield from the wind. A pile of tree trunks and old logs lying outside fairly ask you to sit for a moment and take in some of the loveliness of the scene. You can never exhaust the whole of it, and if you sit for a minute, you will probably sit there for hours. Here is absolute quiet of spirit, but never silence. The trees are seldom still. All day and all night, the wind upon these hills sways the tall, lithe tops of the larches to and fro, to and fro. The leaves and the catkins of the birches are forever fluttering. The vibrant branches of the pines hum and sing in the breezes, summer or winter. The music of it all never ceases, though it varies in volume according to the season. On the hottest summer days the grasses still sigh, the bees hum all day long in the clover, the blue tits tweet and twitter as they swing about the birches, and their cousins the coal tits keep up an endless run of comment in the larches. In May the nightingale comes into the grove to sing. In June rival chaffinches perch on the top spikes of certain spruce trees, always the same bird on the same spike, and defy each other and the world in general. The stock dove croons over its nest in the tallest firs, and the ready brown squirrel scolds you severely if you are coming too near his own particular chosen tree. Inside the woodhouse you may find many things, some you are prepared for, some you are not. In theory, it is sacred to the use of the head of affairs, a sort of playhouse and workshop combined, wherein no handyman is supposed to set foot, and no prying eyes are supposed to discover that the owner is working in a jersey, with no qualms over the absence of waistcoat and stiff collar. But I often go in when I am anxious to be alone, and wanting many things that one cannot put down in words. And knowing this, the head of affairs doesn't keep his best saws there, not the splendid big farmer's saw, with its doubly notched teeth, that run through big fir trunks with amazing ease, nor the finer tools that deal with the short, snappy branches. No, the saw that is left for such emergencies is a nondescript article that now has a wavy, very wavy, edge, and a few of its teeth doubled over, a saw that seems as though you can never get it well into the wood, and once you have got it in, it can't be got out again much less to be made to move with soft purring motion. You see, I have individuality where sawing is concerned, but it is useless to talk about it, for I have come to the conclusion that whatever other moral improvements a woman may manage to effect in the man she marries, it is a life work to get him to a proper appreciation of her method of goffering a saw. But I must beg you not to picture the woodhouse as the home of the miscellaneous collection of nondescript oddments so indescribably dear to every masculine heart. There is an outhouse elsewhere that accommodates short lengths of chain, pieces of wire netting, old locks, bits of copper wire, staples and hooks, broken hinges, that might be made to do duty again if anyone ever has a gate that prefers its hinges to be broken oil cans, a piece of lead pipe, various lengths of iron rods, broom handles, stale putty, old keys, a couple of invalided padlocks. Well, you know the type of things that every self-respecting man likes to gather around him and keep handy, in case he might need them at any moment. Unfortunately, one of the many blighting influences of town life, forever hindering the full flowering of one's better nature, is the lack of the necessary space to stock such useful items. But in the country one is not so hampered, and one's private marine store grows apace, and differs only according to the temperament of the collector. Indeed, I have come to the conclusion that country air develops in man and woman alike that tendency to hoard, which is so noticeable in early childhood, when the small girl collects buttons and clippings from her mother's sewing room, and the small boy bulges the blouse of his sailor suit with string and conkers and coloured chalks 
and old penknives and young frogs. In town, a woman's only outlet, as a rule, is the bargain counter or annual sale or remnant day. These dissipations are denied us in the country, but we make up for it in many other directions. My own particular weakness is jam jars, and the way I pounce on any round pot, be it glass or earthenware, that looks as though it might be made to hold jelly or jam, is quite a study in efficiency. And, like all expert collectors, my collection has subdivisions, or perhaps you would call them ramifications. Cups that have lost their handles, jugs ditto, glasses that once held a rolled tongue or fish paste are all included, and friends, as they bring round a portmanteau full of empty jars at Christmas or on my birthday, say, It is so nice in your case that one knows what you actually want. So much better to give anyone what they really like and will use, rather than some useless bit of jewellery. And I quite agree. There was one moment when I feared my jars would have to go in the general rending asunder of domestic life caused by the war, even though I had determined to stick to them as long as I could. But when that one clear call came for jam pots, naturally I couldn't be a traitor to my country, and I decided the jars at least must go, even though I might perhaps retain the handleless cups and jugs. So I told Abigail to let me know when the grocer called. I interviewed the young lady wearing high white kid boots and an amethyst pendant on her bare chest, who brought my next large consignment of groceries that had to be bought in order to secure a little sugar. But when she heard that there were jam jars to go back, she looked at me coldly from the doorstep, and hurriedly pushing her basket farther up her arm, lest I should attempt to force them into it, I presume, the Abyssinian gold bracelets clanking the while, haughtily informed me that her motor was for delivery only, not for the cartage of empties, and suggested that I should write the manager and see if he would consent to receive them. I am only human, after all, and naturally any woman's temperature would rise in the face of such spurning of her free-will offerings. I didn't write, and I am using the jam jars still. The nation doesn't seem any the worse off, though Virginia points out to me that the war might have ended sooner had I insisted on handing them over. She says every little helps, as is proved by the fact that the very week she put her first fifteen shillings and sixpence into exchequer bonds, the government got the first tank. At any rate, as I never eat preserves myself, I can still, even with a restricted sugar allowance, enjoy the peculiar pleasure that arises within a woman's soul when she is occasionally able to say, quite casually as it were, to a friend, Would you care to have a pot of my new gooseberry and cinnamon jam? They say it's rather good, though of course, etc. And the friend replies, Oh, I should love it, dear. Such a treat. That jar of ginger marmalade I took home last time was positively delicious. Everyone said, etc. One favourite item for collection among the cottagers is old bottles, and the stock you will see in some of their outhouses is often most extensive and varied. On one occasion, an old man who was doing some odd day's work for me about the garden, in the absence of the handyman, was deploring the way the rabbits devastated the cabbages. I'll get rid on em for he if you leave em to me, he assured me. I said I only wished he would as they are a real plague at times. Imagine my horror a few days later, when I took some friends along to see the vegetables, to discover a legion of empty whisky bottles, labels intact, neck downwards in the soil, and dotted about the vegetable garden in all directions. The old man explained that they were put there to scare their rabbits, as they was dreadful frit bottles. But my friends refused to believe that so honest-looking an old Amos could have brought them with him. The inside of the woodhouse is as aloof are the hills from our machinery-driven, smoke-begrimed, petrol-flavoured twentieth century. Even when work is in progress, here is no hustle, there are no shortcuts to the other side of a larch log, the saw must go steadily, patiently, 
almost slowly, if it hopes to get through the tree at one standing. To step from the hot noonday glare on a summer day into the cool seclusion of these thick stone walls is to enter a haven of peace and quiet that would seem to belong to the forest primeval rather than to this noise-stricken age. The window opening to the north excludes the fierce sun, but the yellow-washed walls give light and cheeriness, and the ivy, that ubiquitous plant that scorns all disadvantages and overcomes every obstacle, has crept in under the red tiles and hangs in festoons from the dark rafters, while in other places its pale green shoots have found for themselves a way clean through the thickness of the wall, pushing along crevices and around the stones, till at last they have come to light on the inner side, where they immediately proceed to drape locked trunks and big branches standing in the corner. It is no mere accumulation of timber and sticks that is housed within these rough old walls. The very spirit of the forest seems to permeate the place. Everything is part and parcel of the big outside, the stones that pave the floor, the heap of cones in one corner, waiting to brighten up smouldering winter fires and set them all aglow, the solid sections of some sturdy oak cut to just the right height for seats, the bark stripped from a birch tree, silver white even now, with grey and pinkish paper-like peelings and black breathing marks, and the great brown branches of larch, a tracery of studded twigs and stems and cones that have been placed across the end of the woodhouse, and sweep the rafters at the top, looking, as you enter the door, like some wonderful rood screen, dark brown with age, shutting off an ancient yellow-washed chancel, though such a screen no mortal hand could ever carve. The larch is always in evidence, and gives a resinous odour to the place, as does the sawdust by the bench, a rich brown pile, for very little of our hillside wood is white, most of it ranges from reddish-brown to mahogany colour, though here is a small, creamy white gate in course of construction, merely a little wicket to keep the calves out of the orchard, that is made of straight round branches slit down the centre, so that one side of each is flat and the other semicircular. The design is simplicity itself. Some uprights with a few cross pieces to hold them together and suggest a trellis. Yet the rich cream colour and the satiny surface of the wood make it a thing of distinct beauty. This is only a branch of the lime tree with the bark peeled off. In an ordinary way we seldom have a chance to notice the intrinsic beauty of wood itself. Of course we see it in its polished perfection when it comes to us in some choice piece of furniture or panelling, but this is not exactly the beauty to which I refer. Each branch, each tree trunk has, in its unpolished state, definite characteristics of its own, quite distinct from those we see in the finished product civilization regards as the one end to be aimed for. These characteristics may be rough and are frequently rugged, but their appeal is often all the stronger for this fact. Look at the wonderful ribbing on the rind of this Spanish chestnut. What is it that wakes up in you when you study its lines and formation? You cannot say, yet you respond to it in an indefinable manner. These branches of applewood, only gnarled old things, twisted and crooked and all out of shape, some people would say, yet you know that they would not have been nearly so lovely had they been straight as a dart. The larches with their strong bark showing grey and red and green and furrowed like the sea sand, isn't there something in this that calls to you from back recesses of your being and reminds you of the time when you, no, not you, but your ancestors centuries ago, lived not so much in cities and houses made with hands as out of doors, finding mystery in the green-roofed aisles and the cathedral dimness of forests long since felled? To those of us who spend much time among these hills, each tree within the woodhouse comes as a friend, with a definite personality and distinct association, and we regret its individual 
going out, even though we know it to be inevitable. This giant, that leans against the outside wall, with no possibility of ever getting inside the door until it has been sawn in half, is a big fir, where a squirrel nested, that healed right over in a blizzard. Here is the tall cherry tree that died of a hollow heart, so beloved of the birds that they left us never a one if we got up later than half past four the morning the cherries were ripe. This is the bough from the big plum tree that broke down last August under its weight of fruit. These branches of old apple trees are some of the winter wreckage that was strewn about the orchard. See the lichen that covers them. Could anything be more satisfying to look upon? And these are some of the birches that seemed so frail as they bent to the wind on the slopes with purple twigs and green leaves always moving. Until you have actually handled them, you scarcely realise the strength and toughness of the delicate-looking bark, and you henceforth take a much more personal interest in Hiawatha and his canoe, even though his tree was another member of the family. And that convenient stump you are sitting upon is part of a hoary pear that used annually to clothe itself in white, and then contribute more gallons of perry than it does to think of in these more sober days. But no mere catalogue of contents can describe the charm of this little wind-swept place. To realise it, you must first of all stand in need of quiet and retreat. When the craving comes upon you that impels us all, at one time or another, to get away from things and be alone with ourselves and nature, that we may rediscover our souls. Take a book, if you will. It matters not what, for you won't read it, but to some it is essential that a book be in the hand, if they are to sit still for a moment, and climb the hill to that wood-house. Take a seat on the beech-log by the door, and let yourself absorb some of the spirit of your environment. Keep quite still, when the squirrel trails his bushy tail down the path, he won't inquire after your national registration card. Neither will the pheasant, even though he raises his head with a suspicious jerk as he is feeding among the grass. Little rabbits will dart in and out of their burrows among the bracken. The woodpecker will mock at you from a tree that waves above the roof. A robin will streak down from nowhere like a flash and stand as erect as a drill sergeant on the corner of the workbench while he inquires. But... There is an interruption. He excuses himself for a moment while he goes off to thrash his wife, who ventured to peep in at the window. Let them all have their way. They are as much a part of the general atmosphere of the place as the sweet scent of the evening dew upon the grass, and the ceaseless sighing of the wind in the branches. Moreover, this is home to them. The little folk of the forest are so companionable when you know them. Even the same butterflies will come again and again. I recently spent two hours a day for a fortnight in this spot, and all the time apparently the same butterfly hovered about the door, resting every few minutes on the warm rock among the stone crop, and fiercely chasing off any other butterfly that came within its evidently marked out domain. And the little folk never bore you with their boastings, nor weary you with platitudes, they are content to let you think your own thoughts, to take you as you are, if you will but recollect that theirs are ancient privileges that have descended to them as a world-old heritage. It is you who, helpless in the grip of civilization, sold your forest hearth rights long since, and are now but a stranger, or at best a passing guest, in this outdoor world that was man's first home. Gradually, quiet possesses you, and you hear the trees talking of things that have far outstripped the clash and turmoil of modernity. What is it, they say, those swaying boughs and branches that throb with every wind, and these that stand around you, silently, waiting their last service to man, each with some final sacrificial offering, the apple wood giving in incense, the oak giving in strength and the laurel giving in flame. Theirs is a blessing rather than a message, a lifting of a load from the overburdened heart rather than the teaching of stern lessons. And as you shake off some of the dust of earth that has clogged your soul, 
you find yourself sending out thoughts in directions long forgotten. The things of earth take on new proportions, the first being often last, and the last becoming first. The ministry of the forest trees can never be entirely explained, but one remembers with reverence that our Lord himself worked in some such little woodhouse, where he touched the trees and fashioned the timber with his sacred hands. Haply he left his benediction when he passed that way. End of chapter 13「Fourteen of Between the Larch Woods and the Weir. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jennifer Painter. Between the Larch Woods and the Weir by Flora Clickman. Chapter 14. Abigail's Lonely Sailor. I'm sure I didn't start my career of usefulness with any intention of adopting a lonely sailor. It was Abigail who bestowed him upon me. So far as I remember, it was something like this. Abigail had joined the domestic helpers branch of a guild, organised by some well-meaning souls, for the purpose of befriending those men in the army and navy who are supposed to be without feminine kith or kin of any description, to take an interest in them. She had been lured to a guild meeting by her friend Pamela. Pamela, it should be explained, was my parlour-maid originally, but when the national trumpet sounded for the reduction of one's staff of employees, she had moved a little further along the road to the Gables, a household that fancied they needed a parlour-maid worse than I did. We were mutually quite satisfied with the transference. She had recently had a sister enter the service of a ducal family, and I had found the effort necessary to keep pace with the Duchess exceedingly wearing. Kind hearts may be more than coronets, but they don't always show to such advantage, since one has to wear them inside. As we had parted with no recriminations on either side, naturally I begged Pamela to make my house a home away from home, whenever she pleased, which she accordingly did, and it was on one of her many runs in that she had expatiated on the guild in question, and induced Abigail to sample it. And thus Abigail had returned from the meeting, moved to the very core of her kind heart, by the harrowing details the speaker had related, of fine, daring, courageous, and magnificent specimens of British and colonial manhood, left desolate and uncared for, pining for a word of sympathy and understanding from someone in the homeland, a word that never came, alas. Abigail said it had quite put her off her supper that night, thinking of all those brave men, defending us and our homes right up to their very last breath, and yet... Never a woman to get them a clean pair of socks or a hot meal when all was over. Not a letter of sympathy, not a card with a line on it. Here Cook told her that funeral cards had quite gone out. Not so much as a word of encouragement from any relative under the sun. Every woman at home selfishly engaged with her own concerns. Why, it was a disgrace to the country that our hero should be neglected and put upon by the women of the land in any such way. And please, would I mind her sending off a cake as soon as possible? As of course she had adopted a lonely sailor. Wouldn't have it on her conscience not to. And Cook was quite willing to make it. There was plenty of dripping, and we still had a fair amount of caraway seeds left, and they wouldn't come as expensive as currants. Cook's cousins at the Crystal Palace liked caraways quite as well as currants, if plenty of spice and peel was put in. The fried potatoes had nearly choked her when she was telling Cook about it all. No, not because she was talking with her mouth full. She meant that the very thought of those poor lonely men was like eating sawdust. 
the speaker at the meeting had said he was sure each one present had only to ask her employer and permission would be given immediately and gladly for a cake or potted meat or some other little delicacy to be sent once a week as a sign of sympathy and understanding to one of these grand yet lonely souls of course i immediately and gladly gave permission for the concrete sympathy to be sent once a week but stipulated that it was to be a cake five shillings worth of meat as per my butcher's charges goes positively nowhere when potted i reckoned that a good dripping cake would give the desolate one a deal more sympathy for the money at the same time to keep our rations properly balanced i cut off the small plate of spice buns our only cake luxury which had been in the habit of adorning our sunday afternoon tea-table and oh the care with which we sewed up that first box of sympathy in a remnant of cretonne carefully putting it on wrong side out to preserve its beauty and hoping that when he undid it he would notice what a charming pattern of purple dahlias and blue roses was on the inside and how the creton was just a nice size to make up into a boot bag if he chanced to be needing a new one i pass over the next few weeks while we waited anxiously for the lonely sailor to materialize he was engaged on board h m s the north sea and sailors we know are subject to wind and weather abigail said she almost wished now that she had selected a lonely soldier she could have had one if she had liked but she had chosen a sailor because she thought he might wear better the german sailors didn't seem so pig-headedly bent on fighting as the german soldiers were we did our best to keep the time from hanging idly on our hands by devising as much variety as possible for future menus discussing the respective merits of cinnamon versus coconut as a flavouring and wondering whether after all we shouldn't be more likely to buck up his desolate spirits and more particularly his pen if we sent a sultana cake next week rather than gingerbread i never before knew abigail so prompt in her attendance upon the postman's knock as she was during those blank weeks that accompanied the first half dozen cakes and then when she was in a very slough of dark despondency and constantly wondering who had eaten them since they had evidently never reached him a letter arrived and forthwith abigail trod upon air figuratively i mean not literally in reality i never heard her so noisy she went up and down up and down the stairs past my study door where i was working as though she had lost a step and was looking for it finally when i heard her singing days and moments quickly flying as she o cedar mopped some neighbouring polished boards i knew something must have happened and i opened the door and asked if anything was the matter whereupon she produced the letter from the bib of her apron would have brought it before only knew i liked everything to be perfectly quiet when i was working and didn't i think it was a lovely letter though the handwriting wasn't much to boast of and the spelling even worse it was a straightforward manlike letter he was evidently very pleased to have the cakes and quite touched that the young lady should have been so kind as to think of him he said his people were too far off to send him anything like that his father and mother had gone out to canada when he was 10 years old no one had sent him a parcel so far therefore it was quite a surprise packet when the first one came it was kind of her to ask if he would like some more all he could say was the more the merrier if the young lady felt like it and he signed himself a faithful friend dick after that dick's name became so all insistent in our midst that the whole household appeared to exist solely for the purpose of revolving round him so constantly was it wafted on the four winds of heaven that i remarked to the head of affairs it seemed for all the world as though we had adopted a pet canary 
and were everlastingly wondering if his seed-glass had been replenished. There was only one slight shadow falling athwart the sunshine. Pamela, who was a great authority on how to tell your character by your handwriting, having had her own delineated by her favourite Penny Weekly, had declared that Dick was anaemic and delicate. She knew, because his handwriting sloped downwards, a sure sign. It was also cramped and irregular, an unfailing indication of a mean and grasping nature, while the heavy downstrokes and the absence of punctuation proved as plain as plain could be that he was unreliable. Poor Pamela had had her own disappointments in life, and had been warped a little thereby. Of course, Abigail said she did not believe a word of such rubbish, and she rather liked the funny-shaped letters, and thought the black strokes looked particularly strong and healthy. Nevertheless, it was surprising how that trifle of seed, carelessly dropped, took root in our minds, and how from that date onwards we all regarded Dick as anaemic, and in need of strenuous nourishment, while, if more than a month elapsed between his communications, we couldn't help just wondering whether, after all, he might not be a little mean and grasping, and six weeks demonstrated with absolute certainty that he was unreliable. A month after we received his first letter, there came another, and of course we all fluttered with excitement. Dick still approved of the cakes, I was glad to hear, and since the young lady had asked if there was anything else she could send, he wasn't one to cadge for himself, but there was his mate Mick. He wanted to put in a word for him. Mick, it appeared, was even more lonely, more ignored by the world of women, more in need of sympathetic understanding than he was, and, what was more to the point, was badly in want of a large scarf. Not that Mick would have asked for it himself, very independent Mick was, but since he had so enjoyed half of every cake, and the nights were very cold this time of the year, and he had been his pal for years, why, he felt sure the young lady wouldn't mind his just mentioning it, as he couldn't think of telling her how short he was of socks himself. Mind? Why? We all regarded Dick as a public benefactor. Abigail discovered that Dick and Mick rhymed, and as she said, you didn't have poetry like that brought to the door every day. She suddenly developed the airs of a society belle. She borrowed my copy of The Modern Knitting Book, and might she just run out for an hour in the afternoon to get some wool? You needed thicker wool for scarves than for socks as the shops were so dark at night. Cook, with her numerous cousins on HMS Crystal Palace, a near neighbour of ours, was given to understand that she could now take a second place. There was no getting away from the fact that Mr. Dick and Mr. Mick were actually engaged in the defence of the realm, while Cook's cousins appeared to do nothing more than take joy rides in motor lorries to and fro along our road. Pamela alone was sceptical. She said she should go cautiously. You never knew. But then, she had every reason to be a pessimist. Even her lonely soldier had been sent out to China, and naturally, you can't sympathise so understandingly with anyone when it takes a couple of months before you get an answer to your letter, if even he should chance to write by return, as when he is only across the Straits of Dover. She said she got tired of keeping copies of her letters, so that she might know what he was talking about when he wrote back, only he never did. Surmising that Abigail would have her hand over full if she took on the wants of both men, I said to her, I think I had better adopt Mr. Mick, as I am sure you will have enough to do to provide etc. for Mr. Dick. You can take all the credit for it, and write the letters, but I will settle the bills. And having some socks and a large muffler all ready for dispatch to some needy man, I gave them to her and said I would pay the postage if she would save me the trouble of doing them up 
and taking them to the post office. I also added that a cake had better be sent once a week to Mr. Mick, in addition to the one sent to Mr. Dick. I know something of the appetite of the Navy, and what is one simple cake between two hearty men? Abigail was effusively grateful, took it quite as a personal favour. You might have thought I was settling an annuity on her own father. She explained that naturally she felt more interest in Dick, and was more anxious to spend her money on him. At the same time, she should certainly mention my name to Mr. Mick. It wouldn't be fair to take all the credit to herself. So we left it at that. I consulted with Cook on the subject of securing ample and pleasing variety, combined with unquestionable nourishment, and judging by the amount of information she was able to give me as to what they like, you would have thought she had reared a whole family of husbands. Forthwith, the house was steeped in a perpetual aroma of baking cakes. Of course, the cousins couldn't be neglected either, till I got nervous lest the food controller should make it his business to call. Upstairs, we not only went cakeless, but in order to make sugar ends meet, we drank unsweetened tea and coffee, a trial to all of us and stewed fruit requiring sugar was also taboo. On second consideration, I am inclined to think that it was not, first and foremost, my benevolence that led me to adopt Mick. It was primarily a matter of self-interest. Even in wartime, it is necessary to have a little work done, if only occasionally, in the home, and if the household helpers were to take on yet another outside responsibility, in addition to the many already on their hands, I didn't see where my work would come in at all. And I can't do everything in the evening, after I get home from town. As it was, we were already knitting morning, noon and night for every branch of the services. I put the collection of figures and capital letters that represented Mick's address into my pocket book with other similar data. Periodically, I handed Abigail pairs of socks or mittens, a body belt, handkerchiefs, and similar utilities, and when any seagoing event, such as a raid on a submarine base, or a scrap in the North Sea, or a warship mined, brought the Navy specially to my mind, I would go into the stores and order a parcel to be sent to Mick, adding one for Dick also, if the occasion happened to be a harrowing one. At such times, one feels one cannot do enough for our men, and Dick and Mick little knew how often they benefited by the misfortunes of others. The first time I received a letter from my devoted friend, Michael McLagan, I admit I was a trifle bewildered, as I couldn't for the moment place any member of the McLagan family. But when I read the document through, and noted how kind he considered it, that my friend Miss Abigail should have introduced us, light dawned, and I sent him a postcard, saying I hoped he would always let me know if he wanted anything further in the way of woollens. And thus the months wore on, punctuated by laboriously written communications from Dick, with an occasional card from Mick, who kept more in the background. The great attraction undoubtedly was Dick. He entered into personal details, asked if the young lady had made the cakes herself. Here, I understand, Cook was not too absorbed in her own relations to insist that full credit should be given to the right person. And Abigail wrote, explaining that as she was very much occupied and too busy to attend to the cooking, a friend who lived with her always made the cakes. Whereupon, by return post, I received a sloping, heavy downstroked letter of thanks from the dutiful Dick. On another occasion, Dick sent his photo. After being asked for it times out of number, I believe, it was not as satisfactory as it might have been, because it was an amateur snapshot group, and you know how easy it is to decipher the features when the hand camera has stood a quarter of a mile away, so as to include as much of the landscape as possible and everyone's face is in black shadow under a hat-brim 
that has been tilted forward to exclude the full glare of the sun. Unfortunately, he omitted to put an X against himself, and as there were a dozen men in the group, all in slouch hats and farm attire, to say nothing of the women and children, there was little to help us. But he did say that, as Abigail had told him Canada was the one place above all others that she longed to see, and how she was hoping to go there as soon as the war was over, he had sent his picture taken on a Canadian farm. It was just a little gathering, photographed on someone's birthday. Still, as he hadn't given us any help in the matter, we had to decide ourselves which was the lonely sailor. Though, as Abigail commented, she couldn't understand how, with such a large collection of friends, he could ever have come to be so alone in the world. We picked out a thin, anemic-looking young man, who was standing beside a comfortable, matronly woman in a shady hat and a big apron, and as her age might have been anything from thirty to sixty, we decided she was his mother, and I remarked what a nice homely soul she looked in her checked apron, and no wonder he was devoted to her, and how proud she must be of the dear lad, all of which Abigail accepted as a personal compliment. Winter gave way to spring, and in like rotation, mince pies were superseded by Swiss roll, to make which eggs were struck off our breakfast menu, and marmalade replaced the figs and dates in the parcels that went out to some unknown spot on the world's ocean spaces, all of which our wonderful navy now controls. Likewise, Creton gave place to unbleached calico, my remnants being exhausted. Existence downstairs fluctuated between heights of excitement and depths of gloom. The Crystal Palace authorities had a most unreasonable way of shipping men off to Mesopotamia, Salonica, Hong Kong, Archangel, or anywhere else where they thought the air would prove salubrious, without a single word of inquiry as to whether the transfer met with Cook's approval. Hence, there was a series of constantly recurring blanks to mar what would otherwise have been a life of unsullied joyousness and at such times of depression, Cook darkly hinted that punching tram tickets and ordering people to move up a little on that side, please, would be a deliriously exhilarating occupation compared with the monotony of cake-making for nobody knows who. As every gift-giver is aware, there's invariably a grey hiatus between the sending off of the gift and the arrival of the recipient's gratitude, Hence, the bustle and excitement of getting off each parcel of eatables and pair of socks and tin of tobacco was always followed by a spell of wistful longing, while the postal authorities, out of sheer perversity, we presumed, held back the letter that would have meant so much to Abigail. Moreover, Pamela was doing anything but contribute to the gaiety of nations. She was often in with Abigail on her spare evenings, and seemed to devote the time to perpetual croaks, on one occasion ending with the assurance that, for her part, she should have nothing to do with a man who was merely a common sailor. Self-respect, if nothing else, would make her look for something better than that. I am glad to say Abigail had sufficient spirit left to retort that if he was good enough to fight for her, he was good enough for the bestowal of a cake. Nevertheless, a decided coolness sprang up between them, and for a week or two after this exchange of confidences, Abigail appeared to be sinking in a rapid decline, as they used to call it, and I felt I was positively inhuman to expect her to do a hand's turn in the house. Yet life was not entirely bereft of purple patches. The gloom consequent upon the silence of the Navy lifted occasionally, as, for instance, when we had a bomb drop in our road. Yes, in our very road. Or, at any rate, it was only just round the corner, and as everybody knows, one affectionately appropriates as one's own all neighbouring roads, quite irrespective of the rentals, too, if they chance to possess a bomb. And in any case, it would have dropped in our road, 
if only it had been a hundred yards nearer this way. Ours was quite an up-to-date bomb, one of the sort that went clean through the wood pavement to the depth of a couple of feet, and made a hole large enough to bury a man in, and not a sound window within a mile radius. That's the kind of bomb ours was, and it was trimmed in the latest fashion, with a policeman and a cord right round it, and two gentlemen with pickaxes who scratched the surface of the wood blocks occasionally in the intervals of looking important. They were wearing them like that in London at the time. Of course we, in common with the whole parish, swelled with pride. For a while all social distinction was waived. Rich and poor alike took the same interest in the bomb, or at least in the hole it had made. The bomb itself was removed so quickly that no local eye save that of the police and the pickaxe gentleman ever saw it, though the milkman averred that, as he was driving to the station in the early dawn, he saw a van going in the opposite direction. He couldn't see what was in it, hence it certainly was carrying away the bomb. For the rest of us, however, we had to be content with a brave effort to get as near to the cord as we could, and crane our heads above our shorter brethren in order to catch a glimpse of the gaping void, while a thrill went down every spine, irrespective of bank balances. And we might have remained in that splendidly democratic frame of back until this day, no one being anxious to have any closer acquaintance than his neighbour with the bomb, had it not been that a piece of shrapnel was discovered in the garden next us. Whereupon, the owner developed much upliftedness, and his servants bragged amain. My own staff took it even more to heart than I did, and it was amazing how much time it was necessary for all hands to spend in the garden in order to cut a cabbage or gather three sprigs of parsley. Between them, they didn't leave an inch of the garden unexplored, and it is a fair-sized one. Then, the following morning, Abigail rushed in excitedly with the news that she had discovered a piece of shrapnel in the bonfire debris. I went down to inspect, and was shown an oblong piece of curved iron, wider at one end than the other, and with a sharp spike at the wider end. I confess that to me it was wonderfully reminiscent of the old trowel that had lost its wooden handle, and had lain unhonoured and unsung for a year in the leaf heap but I said nothing about that. Whatever its origin, it was crumpled up a bit with heat, one could see, not surprising either, as we had had a roaring bonfire two days running and burnt up all the pile of dead leaves. When I was devising plans for its removal, they said, hadn't it better wait there till the master came home? But the head of affairs is celebrated for his truthfulness and he and that old trowel had lived on terms of unalloyed friendship for years, till the split came over the handle, and, well, I merely said I thought we would deal with it at once, no need to add to the master's many worries. Cook said, oughtn't it to be immersed in a pail of water? Her cousin at the Crystal Palace had told her that, etc. So we got a pail of water. I bade them stand well out of harm's way, while I put it in. Of course they feebly offered to do it for me, but seemed relieved when I insisted on taking all risks. One ran to one side of the garden, and one to the other, and then decided they should feel safer if they both stood close together. Just as I was about to pick it up, Cook shrieked out to me not to touch it with my hands, as it might be poisoned. I said I would take it up with a pair of tongs, but she said she thought it ought to be insulated with china. It might be electrified with the shock. You never knew what inventions those fiends were up to, and one of her cousins, who was in the electrician's corps, or something like that, had told her that, etc. So we compromised with a large china soup ladle and a big wooden spoon, which I used like chopsticks, and at last got the shrapnel into the water. Of course, it was disappointing when it dropped heavily to the bottom without so much as a sizzle, much less a bang. Still, 
we had the comfortable feeling that we were on the safe side now. Eventually I had it in my study. I said it would be safer there. But though the neighbourhood was thus debarred from seeing and handling it, the fame of it spread with amazing rapidity, and the lady across the road arrived quite early in the afternoon, having heard from her housemaid, who had heard it from her gardener, who had heard it from the road sweeper, who had heard it from the grocer's man, who had heard it from my cook, that I had a huge shell, weighing half a hundredweight, covered with venomous spikes, all deadly poison, that had dropped down the chimney, right into the centre of the kitchen fire, where it had been found, still hissing, when they went to rake out the ashes in the morning. I didn't display the fragment to my neighbour, nor to subsequent callers. It is such a pity to rob people of happiness. I merely said I thought it better to keep it well away from all vibration, as so far it hadn't exploded, and one and all assured me I was very wise, and remembered pressing engagements elsewhere. I reached the zenith of my fame when a police inspector, accompanied by a subordinate, rang the front doorbell, and understood that I had in my possession a portion of a zeppelin that had foundered on my lawn. It appeared that he had been up all night and had worn out miles of shoe leather hunting for the missing half of that zeppelin, and had I the gondola as well? He seemed to suspect that I might be holding that back in order to have it stuffed and put under a glass shade in the drawing-room. He looked disappointed when I showed him the fragment of iron, said they had plenty of bits that size, but he admitted that none of them had a spike like that at one end, and darkly hinted that it might be just the missing link they were looking for. Then he and the subordinate tenderly carried it away between them. We all intend to visit the war museum later on. Personally, I'm very keen to see what they ticketed. Nevertheless, when each little excitement subsided, reaction set in, and Abigail's spirits promptly dropped to zero. But at length, a postcard arrived in time to save her, and us, from utter collapse, and the bath taps were once more polished to the tune of days and moments quickly flying. Thus, as I have already stated, winter merged into spring, and then spring made way for early summer, as I've known it do before, and we racked our brains to find a suitable substitute for pork pie. Oh, yes, we had departed months ago from the nothing-but-cake rule. We decided that a thin, anemic-looking young man, as per the photographic group, needed still more feeding up, and there wasn't a sufficiency of bodybuilding material in modern cake, as everyone knows who has sampled war flour, even with currants as well as caraways. So the head of affairs and I stoically relinquished the one thin slice of breakfast bacon that we had shared between us each morning, and devoted the proceeds to pork pies for the Navy, in accordance with the highest ideals of the food controller. But, as every good housewife knows, you mustn't feed your family, let alone your friends, on pork pie when there isn't an hour in the month, and with April nearing its end, and May looming, what was to take its place? As Cook said, you are so dreadfully handicapped when you have to sew up your parcel in calico. You can't send soused mackerel, or Welsh rabbit, with red tape tied round you like that. Abigail suggested potted shrimps, but Cook scornfully reminded her that seafaring men, living in the midst of shrimps and salt fish all their days, weren't likely to hanker after it at meal times. We compromised on savoury cheese patties, a come-down after the pork pie we admitted, only we could think of nothing else equally nutritive and seasonable. Unfortunately, when I ordered extra cheese to be sent weekly to meet the naval demands, and up to that time I hadn't seen any rules for rationing cheese, the stores greatly regretted, etc., but there was a scarcity at the moment. They could let me have a tin of golden syrup, however, or they had a fair stock of candles. 
so we removed cheese from our upstairs dietary, consoling ourselves with the thought that, at best, it was only half a course. Meanwhile, it was pleasant to know that the fleet had voted the cheese patties A1, due, so Cook said, to the fact that she had told Dick to put the patties into a slow oven for ten or twelve minutes before eating, as it made all the difference. I was beginning to get nervy with the strain of it all. You see, if a letter delayed in coming, then the question arose, did they like the last parcel? Or had we sent, by chance, something they didn't care for? And then my household assistants looked darkly at me. I was to blame for ever having suggested lemon curd tartlets. As Abigail said, probably lemon didn't agree with Dick. It didn't always with thin people. Cook acquiesced, adding that you never can tell. There was her eldest sister's husband, a perfect terror for temper. Yet look what he saved her in doctor's bills. He might have had epileptic fits instead. On the other hand, there was her uncle. No relation to her, really. Only her aunt's husband, and second husband at that. Do what you would, you couldn't rouse him to take an interest in his food or anything else. Her poor aunt had spent a little fortune on medicine, and as bright a house as you could want, not shut off with a whole lot of garden like my house, but nice and close on to the pavement, with heaps of traffic going by. And exactly opposite, the broken railings that the motor van ran into and killed the driver. Heaps of people came to look at the place Sunday afternoons, but her uncle never took a bit of notice of it. No, you never can tell. All the same, I felt guilty, and began to wonder how long I should be able to hold out, and then... It was a lovely Saturday in May. We had just got up from a late lunch, when there came a violent ring at the doorbell. The head of affairs was in the hall at the moment, and he opened the door, to find two big sailormen on the doorstep, each carrying a parcel. They inquired for me. Now, like most other households, khaki and navy blue always find a welcome at our door for the sake of our own who are away, serving their country and those who have already laid down their lives in the cause of right and justice. So the head of affairs walked them straight in upon me, without waiting to ask for their birth certificates. Did I say they were big? That isn't the word for it. They were more than that. They were massive, tall, broad, well-made, and tough-looking, with beaming, round, red faces. They ought to have been pictured, just as they were, for a naval recruiting poster. They looked a little confused, for the moment, at finding themselves precipitated into an unexpected drawing-room, but they made straight for me, with that large rolling stride inseparable from the British sailor. Fortunately, the room isn't beset in the orthodox fashion, with a multitude of bric-a-brac obstacles in the way of small chairs and tables, for they seemed to sweep the decks fore and aft as they strode over the carpet, and I thought I should never find my hand again after they had both given it a hearty shake. As I looked at the big burly fellows, both of them well on to forty, I should say, I knew instinctively that these were our two forlorn sailor lads, our poor, anemic, lonely Dick, and desolate, unsympathised with Mick and I must say I never saw two men bear neglect more bravely. At first, conversation seemed all on my side. They sat stiffly on the extreme edge of their chairs, while Dick answered in monosyllables, Mick seeming permanently tongue-tied. But the head of affairs produced cigars, warranted to banish all nervous embarrassment, and to induce a man to sit comfortably anywhere and soon they were giving us details of their homes and relatives. Small things, perhaps, that are apparently the same the world over, but mean so much to each individual. It was still Dick who did most of the talking. He was undoubtedly the more attractive of the two. As they were constantly making wild clutches at their parcels, which threatened to tumble off their knees without the slightest provocation, we offered to put them on the table. But Dick explained, 
with almost childlike confusion, that they were presents for me and the other lady, and would I mind taking them? He made Mick open his bundle first. There came to light an anchor, the like of which I had never seen before, though I had heard of their existence. It was about eighteen inches long, made of red velvet, stuffed with sawdust, so as to form an immense pincushion. This was most elaborately decorated with beads, as I thought at first, but it proved to be pins with coloured glass heads. Lengthwise down the anchor was this inscription, carried out in large white-headed pins. Affection's Offering There were various ribbon bows, and ends and tags finished off with beads, and a cord for hanging it on the wall. Altogether, it was a most ornate, glittering creation. Keeping company with the anchor was a wooden rolling pin that had been enamelled a delicate pink, with hand-painted sprays of forget-me-nots at intervals. This also had bows and ends, and a ribbon to hang it on the wall. It likewise bore an inscription, to greet you. While I praised the colouring and the workmanship of both, I promptly chose the rolling pin. Mick looked a trifle disappointed, and explained that he had really intended the anchor for me, and thought the rolling pin would be nice for the lady who had sent the cakes. But I clung to the rolling pin. Even though it wasn't quite in line with my ideas of decorative art, its sentiment was so non-committal. Besides, I wanted Abigail to have the anchor. Even though it be but a passing incident, it is pleasant to receive an affection's offering occasionally when we are young. Dick's parcel contained a large box covered with shells, and very pretty it was. In a smaller packet he had a coral necklace. I chose, and praised, the box with a perfectly clear conscience this time. You have to go to a great deal of trouble before you can vulgarise a seashell, and fortunately the box-maker hadn't taken any trouble at all. He had merely stuck them haphazard over the cardboard lid, with a border of small ones round the edges, and the effect was lovely. I also knew that Abigail would much prefer the necklace. You can't carry a big box about with you to display it casually to your friends. My genuine pleasure over the presents thawed them to such an extent that Dick then explained they had come round with the intention of taking us out to a picture palace. Mick wanted to take me, and he, Dick, would take Miss Abigail. But, he added hesitatingly, that perhaps, after all, that wasn't the sort of thing I would care about. And he looked rather beseechingly at the head of affairs, hoping we should understand what he couldn't manage to put very clearly into words. We did understand. Gratitude is none too plentiful in these days that we could afford to flout it because it chanced to appear in unconventional guise. We appreciated all that they had planned to do by way of saying thank you for what we had done for them. And it was little enough we had done when one considers our debt to such men as these. I explained that though I was engaged that evening, Abigail was not, and that they must now show her those parcels. She had no knowledge that they were in the house, and you should have seen her face when she answered the bell, and I introduced Mr. Dick and Mr. Mick. In reply to my inquiries as to what she could do in the way of hospitality, she was certain that Cook could get a really nice meal ready for them in a few minutes, and even if Cook couldn't, she, Abigail, could, and Pamela had just come in, and she would help. It wasn't the slightest trouble, and she looked positively radiant as she took the two in tow. Having told them that we would wait on ourselves for the rest of the day, and no one need stay in, I was not surprised to hear a gay party setting off a little later on. But I was surprised to see that it was Pamela and not Cook, who made the fourth in the quartet. Pamela and Abigail hadn't spoken since the episode previously mentioned. It was curious that she should have chanced to call for the purpose of burying the hatchet, 
the very afternoon that the common sailors, as she had called them, should be there. For the time of the sailors' leave, I cut the housework down to the minimum and arranged a week of cold dinners, Spartan-like in their simplicity for ourselves, so that evenings out could be taken as often as my household assistants pleased. I hoped to find the kitchen radiating sunshine in consequence. Picture my consternation, therefore, when I came upon Abigail weeping her eyes out in their sitting-room one afternoon, when only half of the leave had expired, too, the coral necklace flung into one corner, and affection's offering lying face downwards under the table. To give her opportunity to pull herself together, I picked up the coral necklace, and inquired what Mr. Dick would be likely to think if he saw it there. She sobbed that she didn't know and she didn't care. That Pamela! Then I saw it all in a flash. Well, to make a long story short, Pamela, whom I had long known to be as unscrupulous as she was good-looking, had stepped in and carried Dick right off from under Abigail's nose. She had seen the two men arrive on the previous Saturday afternoon, and that accounted for her unexpected call. She had appropriated Dick from the first minute she saw him. "'And now,' said Abigail into her handkerchief, "'just ten minutes ago, when I ran out to post some letters, "'who should I see coming out of the gables but Dick and that creature, "'starting off together for all the world as though they had known each other all their lives?' Only last night she had the sauce to say she was going out to Canada when the war was over. I felt truly sorry for the girl, and it was some satisfaction to me to reflect that Pamela wasn't quite as successful as she had imagined. I don't think she will see much of Dick, even if she does go out to Canada, I said. I don't think his wife would have a room to spare to invite her there, with seven children. I dare say Dick told you, "'that the lady in the checked apron was Mrs. Dick?' "'I stooped to pick up the forlorn anchor "'and dusted it most carefully "'to give her time to recover. "'No!' she gasped, "'and then went on bitterly. "'He hasn't had a chance to tell me a thing, "'with Pamela talking to him the whole time. "'But of course I guessed all along he was married.' "'She meant to take her disappointment bravely. "'I don't want to marry anyone. "'Men are all alike. "'But it does make you wild when—' "'I was facing the window, but Abigail had her back to it. "'Therefore she did not see what I saw coming along the road, "'a large bunch of flowers surmounted by Mick's round, jovial face. "'I think I should hang this up,' I interrupted her, "'having thoroughly dusted the anchor. "'After all, Mick has no wall of his own to hang it on. "'He isn't like Dick, with a home and wife and family.' and one doesn't get affection's offering every day. Oh, but that wasn't really meant for me, and Abigail's grief threatened to break out afresh. Mick was so taken with the lovely parcels you sent, and he thought as you lived with me you were a widow, and, fortunately, I was spared the rest, for the downstairs doorbell rang with a vehemence that was now most familiar, and Abigail, patting her hair and her cap into shape, went smilingly down the passage to answer the side door. End of chapter 14 Section 15 of Between the Larchwoods and the Weir This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jennifer Painter Between the Larch Woods and the Weir by Flora Clickman Chapter 14 The Bonfire I had pointed out, quite nicely and kindly, to Virginia, that she was not clipping the top of the square box-tree table straight and even. And she had pointed out, quite witheringly, to me that she was cutting it by perspective, adding that if I had only been privileged to learn perspective when I was young, I should have known 
that for a thing to be correct in its outlines and proportions, it must necessarily run askew and aslant and out at corners, just as the top of the box-tree table was now doing. She assured me, however, that it would appear all right, she thought, if I looked at it from an airship above, with half-closed eyes. And then she advised me to do a little hoeing. I ignored her sarcasm, knowing full well that a pair of shears, applied by amateur hands to tough, overgrown green stuff, is apt to provoke cutting remarks when the wielder has got to the moist stage and the hedge is looking like a ploughed field. You see, there was an inwardness in her last remark, for hoeing looks an easy, graceful, carefree occupation, till you try it. My own method is distinctive. I didn't invent it. It came to me as a natural inspiration. I find I invariably start to hoe with my back, doubling up more and more, and aching more and more, as I proceed with the hacking. Then, as I warm to the work, and it's very much warm as a rule, I likewise hoe with my teeth. By the time I have set and ground these nearly to nothing, my hands all the while getting lower and lower down the handle of my tool, I find myself beginning to hoe quite viciously with my head. When I have extracted all the motive power I can from this part of me, and have projected it so far in front of the rest of me, hoe included, that I almost lose my balance, the only thing left for me to do, by way of piling up yet more energy and effort, appears to be to go down on all fours, seeing that by this time I am clasping the hoe handle at about a foot from the ground. Fortunately, it is just here that I usually realise what I am doing, and I straighten my rounded back and undo my teeth, that doesn't sound polite, but you know what I mean, and return my head to its proper place. I then remind myself that I am not hoeing at all scientifically, that most of the energy I have been putting forth has been waste because misdirected force, whereupon I stand at ease and other things like that. Maintaining the upright as far as I can, I take hold of the top end of the long handle of my weapon, and still keeping quite in the perpendicular, I merely hoe with my arms, thus saving the rest of me quite a considerable number of unclassified aches. So long as I can remember to keep my vertebrae like this, all is well, and I really get through a fair amount of work. But, alas, I soon forget. One thing I have never managed to do is to keep cool and collected, my misfortune being that I boil up so soon. My hat gets out of angle, my hair flattens out where it ought to be wavy, and waves around where it ought to lie flat, and, worst of all, it ceases to worry me that these things are so. And then I open a periodical wherein some unknown celebrity has been photographed at home, and she is sure to be shown in the garden, where, behold, you see her in the airiest of fashionable nothings in the way of a white frock, accompanied by a ten-guinea hat, a twenty-guinea dog, and a sixpence halfpenny trowel, all worn with consummate photographic grace, as she artlessly sets to work to transplant a hoary wisteria that has smothered the photographer's veranda for fifty years, explaining to the interviewer, meanwhile, how she simply adores gardening, how she gets all her ideas for the dresses she wears in the third act from her pet bed of marigolds, and how she never dreams of taking part in a first-night performance without having previously run the lawn-mower twice round the gravel paths. Clever creature! You don't wonder she is labelled a celebrity. Any woman who can keep that hat on while using that trowel has accomplished something. I didn't feel like hoeing just then, no matter what the cost of my gardening outfit. The moment seemed to call for non-strenuous occupation that would admit of leisurely movement and unlimited pauses, with nothing doing, which is what I find a mind like mine requires. Of course, there was plenty of hoeing waiting to be done. There always is. 
I never knew a soil so chock-full of weed-seeds as ours seems to be, and I never knew a place where folks are so little worried by them. Where things grow as easily as they do about our hills and valleys, and where the angle of the garden is just what ours is, you will find that the native reduces land labour to the minimum, and nothing is disturbed unless absolutely necessary. Reasonably, if you have left the hoe at the top of the garden, and the top is a hundred feet above the bottom of the garden where you are standing, you think twice before you climb up and fetch it. As one result of this universal conservation of energy, our local nettle crop is one of the finest in the kingdom, I verily believe. Why are those things left standing in every field corner? I asked a farmer on one occasion, pointing to the usual grey-green waving jungle of weeds. Lay nettles? he questioned in surprise. Well, what's the good of wasting attention on em? They don't hurt no one. Incidentally, I may say it is always well to criticise the methods employed on other people's land rather than those practised on your own, since most right-minded employees resent any implication, no matter how politely you wrap it up, that improvement is possible. And if you question the why and wherefore of anything, it may be mistaken for fault-finding in this imaginative age. Hence, unless the handyman chances to be one of exceptional make-up, I go farther afield when gleaning information. One day I watched a man very leisurely inspecting a thistle in a meadow by the weir, and then, with a deliberation that was most restful to a harried, hustled, wartime Londoner, he tenderly and carefully cut it off near the ground with a scythe. After he had decapitated about twenty thistles in this way, he naturally needed a little time for recuperation, and sat down on the river bank to meditate. I hadn't liked to interrupt him when he was working, because so far as I could roughly estimate, there were thirteen thousand four hundred and fifty-three thistles in the meadow, approximately, you understand and we don't work according to trade union hours here. Sometimes we start an hour later, and leave off an hour earlier, and miss out several in between. But since he had evidently reached his rest hour, and remembering that one of my own fields was plentifully dotted with thistles at the moment, and feeling quite equal myself to that gentle, picturesque swish of the scythe, I asked him whether that process killed the thistle right out. My business instinct forbade my wasting time on the job if it would all have to be done over again later on. No, he said. He didn't think as how it would kill the thistles right out. Then why did he do it that way? I asked, instead of spudding the thing right up by the root. Well, and he scratched his head thoughtfully, doing it like this just discourages of them a bit and isn't such a deluge of trouble as mooting em right out would be. And with that he promptly dropped thistles, and proceeded to discuss the fiendishness of the Germans. He had a long talk, there wasn't room for me to say anything, and gave recipes for annihilating completely everything connected with them, excepting thistles. I presume they have some, they deserve a good crop anyhow. Finishing up with, but there... What I says about them I won't exactly repeat in your presence, m'm, for my wife often says to me, It won't do nobody no particular good, she says, if you gets yourself shut out of heaven by your language, she says, just to spite em Huns, what don't even hear it. For a full two minutes he worked that scythe with real zest, as though on slaughtering the enemy. Perhaps his method is right in regard to thistles, I mean. Perhaps it is wrong. I have never gone sufficiently deep into the subject to be competent to pass an opinion. But I do know that the larger proportion of handymen who have honoured me with their patronage, though there are conspicuous exceptions, invariably weed on these lines of least resistance, and just discourage them, though I own it takes a lot to discourage our weeds. Not feeling like discouraging weeds at the moment, I asked Ursula to suggest some occupation for my idle hands, though I didn't put it like that. 
I inquired which of the many jobs needing urgent attention I had better tackle next. It came to the same thing in the end, but instead of advertising my natural indolence, I hoped it would convey an impression that I was rushing pell-mell through an endless succession of tasks. Ursula was sitting on a pile of logs under a big fir tree inside the orchard gate. Oh, yes, there are firs in the orchard, and lilacs, and daffodils, and snowdrops, and a huge wellingtonia, and a trickle of water with forget-me-nots and mint on its brink. We are not at all particular about classification. She was darning a stocking, and it seemed a lengthy job. Not that there was any large vulgar gash in the stocking. It was merely suffering from general wartime debility, and was one of those that you can go on and on darning, and still find more thin places to run up and down. Have you ever noticed what a snare a stocking of this description can be? You can sit at it for an hour or so, until it seems easier to go on darning it than to bestir yourself to do anything else. In the end, you haven't accomplished much, considering the time you've been about it, but you have acquired a large dose of the virtuous and exemplary feeling that is always the outcome of stocking darning. Ursula had got like that, though I wouldn't have you think I underestimated her efforts, for it was my apparel she was darning. "'I often think that a garden embodies all the philosophy of life,' she replied to my query, in a detached way, as she closely inspected the stocking foot drawn over her hand, in order to pounce upon any further signs of impending dissolution. "'I seem to fancy I've heard that.' Oh, I've no doubt someone has said it before me. I've noticed over and over again that people plagiarise my really cleverest remarks before I've actually had time to say them myself. And I think something ought to be done to prevent the infringement of copyright in this barefaced way. But all the same, whether anyone has or has not already helped themselves to this unique creation of my brain... The fact remains that I thought it out for myself, alone and unaided, and the more I meditate upon it, the more I notice what heaps of things in the garden resemble life. As for example, well, slugs, for instance, and the bindweed, and the rabbits, and the broad beans. They all seem to typify that here we have no abiding anything. I agreed mournfully as I thought of the succulent, hopeful-looking scarlet runners that the slugs had eaten right through the tender main stems close to the ground. It was a sad awakening for us the day we found a few score of limp and dying remains, where overnight we had watered as promising a row of youngsters as one could have wished to see. To our grieving spirits, it seemed as though it wouldn't have been nearly so bad if they had eaten the leaves and left us the stems. At least more leaves might have grown, whereas now... And the bindweed! Where could you find a more striking analogy to original sin? Flaunting beautiful flowers, which I greatly love, yet all the while spreading wicked roots out of sight, choking everything it lays hold of, turning up in the most unlooked-for places. But there is no need to write more under this heading. A healthy crop of bindweed and I never knew one that wasn't most irritatingly healthy, could give points to a preacher every Sunday in the year, and then have enough to spare for the weeknight services. And when he had done with bindweed, he could start afresh on mint. Rabbits, again, are dear things, with an appeal that is quite different from that of any other of the wild things. Sometimes in the past, when I have been doomed to sit for an hour or so, in the airlessness and weariness of crowded hall or place of entertainment, or in the loneliness of a congested social function, where everybody is too buzzingly busy with being social to have time to say a word to anyone, I just switch my mind right off the glare and the heat and the stuffiness and the superficiality and the heartlessness and take a look at the little orchard adjoining the cottage garden and for just a minute I watched the rabbits, nibbling the grass, sitting up on their hind legs to get a better view of any possible enemy approach, and scampering back to cover in the coppice 
with a bobbing of white tails, at the least suspicion of danger. To a woman there is something very touching about the timidity of these little brown things. I always wish I could make them understand that I am their friend, and not their enemy, but this is a difficult matter, because there is the small white dog to be considered in the compact, and there is no sentimentality about him where rabbits are concerned. I wouldn't be without these little furry families in the coppice, but, oh, I do wish they would leave the young cabbages alone, or at any rate spare the tenderest of the green leaves. It's a bit damping even to ardour like ours to be greeted, when we arrive from town, by a gardener waving a deprecating hand over rows of hardy cabbage stumps, bereft of leaves. At such times it seems as though it wouldn't have been nearly so bad if they had eaten the stems and left us the leaves. At least we could have cooked them. Whereas now... Rabbits certainly emphasise the fact that life grows thistles as well as figs. With regard to the beans, it is difficult to be philosophical. I can be to some extent resigned when my misfortunes are handed out to me by nature, but it is a different thing when they are manufactured for me at my expense too, by my fellow creatures. On the whole, I cannot speak too highly of the men who have worked for me about the flower patch. I have been exceedingly well served. But now and again one comes upon misfortune, and on one occasion I found I had engaged an Ananias of the most proficient type. During his brief regime, the weeds thrived apace, while the choicest bulbs and flowers took on a world of discouragement. When the black pansies and the heliotrope Spanish iris feathered with white and yellow, and the rare delphiniums and the yellow arum lily disappeared at one fell swoop, Ananias shook his head sadly and put their defalcation down to the rush of the rain and the angle of the earth. Everything do simply run off this soil, he explained. Quite true, it certainly did, and two legs invariably ran with it, and the vegetables seemed as subject to discouragement as the flowers, though it was always referred to as blight. There were the broad beans, for instance. I had given him two quarts of seed, and indicated where I would like them planted. They were a special prize strain that had been sent to me by a famous firm of seedsmen, who had been moved to this generous deed on reading some of the chronicles of the flower patch when they were first published in the woman's magazine the head of the firm wrote me that they were a new mammoth variety and they would be pleased if i would try them in my cottage garden we planned great things when those broad beans should be ready two quarts would make about ten rows we reckoned quite a goodly plantation for us and we decided that as we should have plenty considering our small household, we would be extravagant and gather our first dishful when they were quite young, and in that delicious tender state that is unknown to the town dweller, who seldom sees a broad bean till it is a tough old patriarch, and in such a condition considers it a coarse vegetable. It was a cold day in February when I handed the seed to Ananias. We were returning to London the same day, so we beguiled part of the long journey discussing whether that first dish should be accompanied by parsley sauce and boiled ham, or whether to fry the ham and have the broad beans given one turn in the frying pan after they were boiled. The subject seemed more and more vital the further we got along the road, for we couldn't get luncheon baskets. No, not the war. It was before that event, and due to one of the many cheerful strikes with which our pre-war existence was punctuated and the bananas and banbury cakes we purchased en route seemed woefully unsatisfying. Hence, it was pleasant, but very tantalising, to contemplate that dish of beans, and we finally agreed that the ham should be fried, and that we would dig some new potatoes, specially for the occasion. We sat and meditated on that meal, as the winter landscape flew past us, and the more we meditated, the more violently hungry we got. You see, 
the beans really assumed more than ordinary importance. But alas, when bean time came, all that decorated the bean plot was one miserable row of wretched-looking stalks. "'It's that there blight again,' remarked Ananias. "'I watched it a-coming up the valley.' "'But why didn't you pinch off the tops if they were showing blight?' I inquired. "'Then they would have made fresh shoots lower down.' He shook his head and looked at me pityingly. "'We don't do our beans like that a here.' "'And where are all the other rows?' I asked. "'I suppose blight didn't carry off roots and all the remainder.' "'No, for slugs I warrant, or birds, or else the seed was stale, maybe.' Ursula carefully turned over the rest of the ground later on, but never a glimmer of a benighted bean did she find. Still, Ananias was, as usual, quite willing to be obliging. "'My beans has done uncommon well this year,' he continued. "'It's just all accordin' how it takes em. Sometimes mine does well, and t'other people's doesn't, and then again t'other people's have a fine crop, and I won't have a bean.' I can let you have some of mine if you like. I know you're powerful fond of broad beans. I allus say you're just like my missus. I'm sorry I haven't a portrait of stout, unwashed, sixty-five-year-old Sapphira to reproduce. Without it you cannot possibly understand how pleased I was. He brought over half a bushel, explaining that he had to charge tuppence a pound more than other people, as these were specially large and good yielders. That were expensive in the first place. They were remarkably fine beans, indeed as fine as I have ever seen, and I wrote to the firm of seedsmen and told them their mammoth variety had proved all they claimed for it. I conclude the miserable row in my garden was a tuppenny packet bought from the travelling huckster who peddles seeds around the villages at suitable seasons. These instances are sufficient to indicate the trend of Ursula's thoughts when she started to philosophise on the garden. She interrupted her valuable remarks, however, to exclaim, "'Do look at that wench!' And Virginia might well be looked at. Her exertions had turned her the colour of a peony. Down her face streamed copious extract of forehead. The clipping mania had got thorough hold of her, and she was trying to trim every hedge about the place, leaving in her wake a trail of clippings for someone else to clear up, as is the way with all first-class amateurs. The next task pointed out itself. Ursula got a birch broom while I trundled the wheelbarrow out of the tool barn, and seeing that there was already a pile of green stuff waiting disposal, I started a bonfire, while Ursula swept up and supplied extra fuel. I feel sorry for the town-dweller. He knows nothing of the real charm of a bonfire. All too often the word stands to him for nothing more than a mass of damp and decaying leaves that simply won't burn. He can only attend to it after his return from business, unless he be one of the favoured few in town who have gardens sufficiently large to allow of their keeping regular gardeners. And unfortunately... The lighting restrictions of the present day give no real scope to the bonfire-maker, even if he has anything worth burning. His dank mass smoulders to death, or he adds paraffin to encourage it, and the neighbours close their windows with meaning violence, while the parish reeks of the obnoxious odour. Seldom has he air enough to fan anything like a good fire, and at length, after burning the dozenth newspaper, and listening to minute statistical particularization on the part of his wife, regarding the present price of matches, collectively and individually, with deviations, re sultanas, lemon soles, kitchen tea, coal cards, sugar for the charwoman, halfpenny per pound for delivery, soda, a financial comparison of pre-war sirloin with modern soup bones, and the antiquity of the new-laid hen, he flings himself disgustedly indoors again, depositing a layer of greasy town-garden soil and dead leaves on the doormat, and perchance trailing it up to his dressing-room. The town bonfire is usually an abomination. The country bonfire is often sheer delight, 
and the reason for this difference is due to the fact that the shut-in nature of the average town back plot seldom supplies the good current of air that a bonfire needs to get it going full swing and more than this the refuse that collects in a town garden is often sooty unsanitary and malodorous whereas in the country there is a great diversity of stuff to be burnt and much of it is delightfully aromatic also the wind that sweeps continually over our hills for instance dries up the rubbish pile unless it be actually raining we seldom get that dank sodden stuff that is the bane of the town gardener we can always get a current of air if not a stiff breeze to fan the first stages and being unhampered by the claims of city offices we can start it in the morning and keep it going the whole day long our only trouble is to get the red-hot mass to slumber through the night it has such a trick of suddenly bursting out again about two a m lighting up the cottage in the dark and flaming forth a vivid beacon worthy of the men of harlech and recalling stirring scenes in old romance only the local constabulary have no poetic leanings and merely see in it a case for a ten pound fine under the defence of the realm act i started the bonfire not with newspapers these are far too few and precious why our very paper bags are smoothed out and treasured in a dresser drawer some done with straw and dry leaves make a good beginning with some of the dead twigs from the larches if there are laurel clippings to put on next and there usually are then success is assured soon the flames were licking up my initial work and i proceeded to pile on hedge trimmings the sweepings up of an apple tree that had blown down and been sawn up and how sweet they made the air thistles nettles brambles surplus raspberry canes that spring up everywhere a holly bush that had lately been cut down worthless gooseberry bushes piles of ivy that had been cut from the walls more barrow loads of stuff tipped on by ursula how the laurel flared and the yew crackled and one's eyes smarted as the smoke swept round like a whirlwind and enveloped one at times i am a great believer in the burning of all refuse vegetation it does away with so much blight and vermin and plant disease and clears out mosquito haunts and is generally sanitary virginia had betaken herself to cooler climes but ursula and i worked at that heap forking on new stuff to stop up flame bursts till we too were shedding dew from our foreheads and our hands were almost sore with wielding the heavy forks yet a fascination keeps you at it till you are smoke dried and fire toasted and arm aching to the last degree when the shades of evening finally call you in as a rule meals are most perfunctory when a bonfire is in progress you are saturated from head to foot with the bonfire your very hair has absorbed the time-old pungent odour of the smoke of forest fires and maybe months and months afterwards you open a seldom used wardrobe where old gardening gear and shabby mackintoshes are kept and suddenly you are overwhelmed with the scent of burning pear and birch leaves and you the lure of the woods calls aloud to you you feel the sweep of the winds on the hills alternating with the great swirls of grey-blue bonfire smoke the cramped town vanishes and you are in free open spaces once more and all because a certain tweed skirt or light gardening coat is hanging in the corner of the wardrobe if you want a bonfire with a delicious scent that will haunt you with a poignant memory long after its ashes have gone the way of all things pile up dead apple leaves and twigs pine needles beech leaves the trimmings of the sweet bay bushes brambles rose stalks and larch and the incense of the forest will be yours bringing with it a mystic sense of nearness to primeval things that no perfume sold in cut glass bottles has yet been able to conjure up we didn't wait till sundown however that day for we were in the most thrilling part of the afternoon forking up and our complexions were at their very very worst when abigail tripped out and announced the rector 
"'Oh, you needn't worry about your appearance, ma'am. "'Miss Virginia's talking to him. "'Yes, she's changed her dress "'and is telling him just what you look like.'" End of section 15